werewolves, vampires, and zombies, oh my. Silver bullets, gargoyles, pits, and pendulums. Bloodborne style reeks of the most classic horror cliches outside of Castlevania. I remember one part where I was watching a coven of witches dance under the full moon, and I thought that this game's scenery was just one pumpkin away from being a token spooky level of a late 90s platformer. What was genuinely horrifying fiction a hundred years ago is borderline hokey today, and it's a wonder that Bloodborne's brutal combat mechanics and monster designs managed to make this Bram Stoker stroker still spook in 2015. But for as much Dracula and Van Helsing there is in there, the second half goes full Lovecraft. And that's what had me giddy. Because video games tend to have a rocky relationship with Lovecraft. They love the imagery and the style of his horror, but the underlying tones that set it apart are a bit hard to convey with traditional mechanics. And Bloodborne's no exception. Howard Phillips Lovecraft was a horror fiction writer of the early 1900s whose stories followed a series of unfortunate narrators who were driven to insanity after learning of an ancient cosmic civilization hidden somewhere beneath Earth's oceans. His consistent theme of hearing disempowerment, insignificance, and insanity from an unreliable narrator might be more easily adaptable to experimental artsy games or nonviolent point-and-clicks rather than a conventional action game where you kill things with health bars. But their imagery of slimy sea gods and mad cult leaders that worship them are all over action games. Basically, if you ever see a hero explore a dilapidated village not marked on a map, and he's later accosted by an angry town mob after learning that they worship slimy, squiddy sea creatures, that's Lovecraft. That's the shadow over Innsmouth. And a modern-day reading of Lovecraft makes it impossible not to notice some, uh, well, let's say antiquated descriptions of certain people. It's no coincidence that the folks most entranced by the Cthulhu cult in his books were, and I quote, men of a very low, mixed-blooded, and mentally aberrant type, and that the practices of the Cthulhu cult were infinitely more diabolic than even the blackest of the African voodoo circles. It was a different time or something. Lovecraft was horribly racist, Bloodborne has horrible frame drops. We can't all be perfect. The practitioners of Lovecraft's evil are described as isolated backwoods people who the author intends to be susceptible to superstition, and I'm bringing that up for a very particular reason. A reversal of that concept makes for the biggest twist in how Bloodborne uses Lovecraftian horror. It's also what made some of those grand reveals during the mid-game so exciting for me. Because in Bloodborne, the worship of those massive alien sea gods is practiced by the majority. That doesn't usually happen. What would be a secret cult in any other fiction is the dominant religious institution of this society, and the eldritch truth that a bunch of horrifying alien sea god things existed inside of a wide world outside of humanity's capabilities was not exactly a well-kept secret here, and spreading that knowledge around was a terrible idea. Warning, if you haven't played Bloodborne and have already made it this far, I urge you to turn back now. The game rakes in the Lovecraft references more heavily in the second half, and I'm about to get into specifics. The Eldritch Truth is Eldritch for a reason. It was one of Lovecraft's favorite words. It wasn't too commonly used back then, and nowadays Eldritch Horror is a term almost synonymous with Lovecraftian horror. In Bloodborne, these massive tentacled alien creatures that look like humanoid aqualife are worshipped as some kind of god. They're very similar to the Great Old Ones from the Cthulhu Mythos, but they're simply called the Great Ones in Bloodborne. They are unknowable, mysterious, and probably evil, if their motivations are even comparable to human motives at all. It drives people mad just to look at or even hear about them, as evidenced by the mental state of nearly every narrator in the Cthulhu mythos, and, in Bloodborne, the insight that causes a lack of frenzy resistance gained upon fighting these bosses and hearing exposition from NPCs and areas full of the minions of the Great Ones, like the celestial gray alien blobby thingies, are filled with corpses containing madmen's knowledge, which are skulls damaged by the effects of that alien contact. In the Cthulhu mythos, the madness gained by exposure to the Old Ones is worshipped by the branches of its cult. And that is also the case in the major religious institutions of Bloodborne. These people regularly make contact with the Old Ones and feel they have something to gain from it. Mad Men's knowledge is offered up as rewards to good church members. The game's central plot, that has worshippers making a bid for accelerated evolution by ways of crossbreeding humans with Old Ones, is also the plot to Shadow Over Innsmouth, in which townspeople breed with Deep Ones to create immortal offspring. 
Also, in the Call of Cthulhu, the language of the Old Ones is not efficiently spoken. Instead, it's transcribed as runes memorized in the mind, just like the Carol runes are in Bloodborne. The Yarnamites in Bloodborne make contact through ancient artifacts discovered by an ancient civilization that came before them, the Thumerians, who also borrowed a lot of their spelling from Lovecraft. His characters would oftentimes find similar artifacts, sometimes left behind by mad Arabians from a thousand years earlier, to learn about the old ones with. The merging of dreams and reality is also a commonly shared theme. The Dream Cycle stories were a collection of Lovecraft works about alternate worlds that can be entered through dreams, and Bloodborne has many of its characters living inside tangible dream worlds. And for all the monsters that clearly take inspiration from Cthulhu, there is at least one straight-up transplant. The Shoggoth is described as a shapeless congeries of protoplasmic bubbles, faintly self-luminous, and with myriads of temporary eyes forming and unforming. In Bloodborne, there's a Shoggoth in the Nightmare of Mensis, captured and suspended by chains to ward off intruders. It fills up an insanity meter if you're within its view, even from thousands of yards away on the grounds below. That insanity meter is really important, by the way, in context of this game attempting Lovecraftian horror. I mentioned earlier that the typical Lovecraft protagonist is an unreliable narrator. They're almost always driven to insanity, suicide, or some other kind of mental destruction after investigating the old ones. So having some kind of sanity tracking system has been standard issue for Cthulhu games since the pen and paper RPGs of the early 80s, all the way up to the Call of Cthulhu video game in 2005, and even inspired offshoots like Eternal Darkness and Amnesia the Dark Descent, and now Bloodborne. But what they've specifically done for Bloodborne is try to represent that insanity meter in a way that still fits the mechanics of the previous Souls games it follows so faithfully. Insanity in the Cthulhu mythos is a two-way street, where eldritch knowledge of the Old Ones inevitably leads to madness as a result. In Bloodborne, those two factors are represented by insight and frenzy, and their relationship to one another, and the way in which they homage Lovecraft, is so subtle you might not even notice it happening. Insight is received from bosses, as well as from talking to NPCs and discovering new locations that are specifically related to eldritch story arcs. Because, after all, the protagonist of Lovecraft still gain devastating mental effects, even from second-hand accounts of the Old Ones. And Insight, for its advantages, carries a burden. What you might never have noticed even after a full playthrough is that beating bosses isn't the only thing that rewards Insight. Just laying eyes on them gives you one point for it at the very beginning of a fight. Insight represents the inhuman knowledge gained by your character, and as you gain more, you begin to see through the illusions of the Great Ones, which leads to insanity. Insight, unfortunately, lowers your frenzy resistance, which outright kills you from a few select monsters that give you that status effect, like the Shoggoth. So balancing your character's knowledge of the unfathomable with their own mental fragility is where the Lovecraft homage goes from visual to mechanical. It's not exactly a major overstated gameplay feature, but it is there, and that's the area where most games about eldritch horror tend to skimp out from being full-blown Lovecraft adaptations. Because if you can retain full control over your character, it's not 100% faithful. If you can defeat these monsters or overcome your insanity, it's not 100% faithful. If there is any relative importance placed on human efforts over those of the old gods, th then you get the idea. But even though you can fight and defeat a few of the Great Ones, which would seem to be as huge a contradiction to Lovecraft as any, Bloodborne manages to keep it subtle in a way that even the official games do not. Call of Cthulhu, Dark Corners of the Earth begins promising enough, with you investigating puzzles and dialogue in adventure game fashion, before it peters off into kind of a bland shooter. There's a part in the mid-game where you're gunning down Dagon from a boat, and the whole game just kind of jumps a shark that Bloodborne never really does. Although, mechanically, you can still overcome the odds and defeat the villains in Bloodborne, the narrative endings reinforce that Lovecraftian sense of smallness, with each one revealing your character being played by the hands of greater powers. But by having different names and rules than the official Cthulhu mythos, it can still work mysteries. That descent from Bram Stoker to Lovecraft had me so excited because it seemed in an instant that the game's universe suddenly got incredibly larger and more complicated than before. And isn't that the point? Cosmic horror is all about realizing how much more there is to the universe than can ever be experienced by all of mankind's accomplishments. 
The post-war, pre-civil rights environment Lovecraft wrote in, with all the pessimism towards the world and the distrust for the people in it, manifested into horror, where the universe was vast and terrifying, and all of mankind was less than insignificant. The horror that people probably felt reading Lovecraft a hundred years ago can still be felt by zooming out really far in Space Engine. To put that in terms of Bloodborne, the supernatural mechanics behind those werewolves, zombies, and vampires suddenly seem petty when it's revealed that extraterrestrial alien gods who are actually from outer space are behind everything. Suddenly, I wanted to know everything. I had to find out what these statues meant, what those cage helmets were for, and I'm still aching to know what's at the bottom of the Chalice Dungeons. The Souls game formula, with its brutal difficulty and its vague but concrete lore, does an excellent job of prodding the player's morbid curiosity. And so does Lovecraftian horror. In both cases, you're going to end up confused and terrified at what secrets you uncover.